Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Now the title of this session is called Focus Fallacy. That's got nothing to do with a magnificent appendage that belongs to me. No, that's a different word. Strangely enough, the English language can be very confusing. But that word begins with PH. A silent P, as in Bath. Now, this fallacy begins with F. And I'm just going to read the dictionary definition of what that word means because I think it says it all. An idea that a lot of people think is true, but is in fact false. For a long time I've been telling you that if you change the speed on this machine you will change the focal point. You can't set the focus for cutting at 10 millimeters a second and then expect to get good results at 400 millimeters a second because the focus will be out by one or two, sometimes three millimetres, depending on what the focal length of your lens is. Now that really just doesn't make sense. Now, my wife is very posh, and she has a thing called a monocle. Yeah, I borrowed the lens, and here it is. And as you can see, it magnifies. Now, we're stuck on this machine with two forms or shapes or types of lens. One is called a plano convex and the other is called a meniscus lens. Now both those shapes are sold to you with a focal point and you can clearly see that focal point if you look through the lens you will find that things are only crisp and clear at one particular distance away from the lens. That's because the lens is designed with a fixed focal point. So if the focal point is fixed, how can it change when I change speed? Always been a bit of a puzzle to me. Now the work that I've been doing recently, trying to understand the mechanism by which lenses cut, has been extremely revealing. Once I understood what, how that mechanism works, all sorts of other problems that I've noticed in the past seem to fall into place. Focus is one of those. So today, I'm going to show you the first stage of my thought process. And I think you'll be quite amazed at some of the things that I'm going to tell you today about this thing in your machine called focus. Now every lens has got a focal point, which is fixed, as I said. Now today's session is all about proving that that focal point is not fixed. Today I'm going to prove A, that speed does affect the position of the focal point, which is impossible because it's fixed in the lens, but hey, I'm going to do the impossible. I'm also going to show you that power can do the same thing. So speed and power can shift your focal point. And then something that will amaze you and you've never thought of before is the material itself can change your focal point. If you swap from one material to another, it'll have a different focal point. So there are three variables on this machine that cause the focal point to drift around. And it doesn't stay at the fixed focal point that the manufacturer designed it as. It could be a very boring session because I'm going to do lots and lots of tests. I'm going to do all the tests and then we're going to look at the results. But first of all, I'm going to show you what the test is that I'm going to do. In here, I've got a 38.1 or an inch and a half gallium arsenide lens. And it is arranged with flat side down. Now, I've measured the dimension from the tip of the nozzle to the face of the lens. And it's 10.3 millimeters inside the nozzle. Now this is a 38.1 millimeter designed focal point. Subtract away from that the 10.3 that's hidden inside the nozzle. And what's outside the nozzle, i.e. the gap that I'm going to have to set to the work, is 27.8 millimeters. Here I've got my little gap gauge, but it only runs up to 20 millimeters. So I could be in trouble. Here I've got a piece of 10 millimeter thick acrylic. And when I put the two of these together, I measure up at 27.73, which for the sake of a couple of hairs, 
we're not going to worry. That's 27.8. You've probably all seen me doing my focus test before. Now I'm going to work in roughly the same place on the machine all the time, which is about the middle of the work table. My normal way of setting this machine for the focus test is to step down by four millimeters. One, two, three, I'm going to step down by three millimeters in this case and we're going to settle on a nice round number 15 millimeters. I've set that gap now three millimeters into the work and what I'm now going to do is run my focus test which drops down by one millimeter at a time. I'm trying to find out whether or not this test will tell me where the focal point is and normally we look at the focal point as being the thinnest line that we can generate. I'm not going to bother to extract because, hey, you know, that's going to cause a lot of noise in the background. So we'll just accept the fact there might be a little bit of smoke. So I'm running this test at full power for this machine, which is roughly 70 watts. And I've got a speed of 400 millimeters a second, which is what you would want to do normally for normal engraving. Remember I had my gauge set to 15 millimetres plus the 10 which is 25, 26, 27, 28 plus the 10 millimetres buried inside so that's 38.1 so that one there so it's basically 15, 16, 17, 18 that one there 38.1 should be the thinnest line. Unfortunately the thinnest line in that instance is not 38 it's 37. I've measured the distances and we've set things up perfectly but we still haven't got a 38 millimeter focal point we've got a 37 millimeter thinnest line the idea being that the thinnest line is the point through which all the rays are passing and therefore that must be the focal point we're now going to change the parameters to something a bit strange 10, 10 millimeters a second and 10 percent power Again, at every line, the table drops by one millimetre. So this test is basically passing through the focal point to see if we can find out where the focal point is. Now the thinnest line there is at 37 millimetres. And you'll say, ah, yeah, but that's what it was before. Well, I have to say, it was difficult to spot which was the thinnest line there, so I had to look at them under my eyeglass. And when I looked at those under the eyeglass, and then looked at these under the eyeglass, I'm afraid I had to come to a slightly different opinion. I made a mistake. So it's 36 millimetre focal point at 400 millimetres a second, and 37 millimetres at 10 millimetres a second. Does it really mean to say that it's 37 at 10% power, and 36 at 95% power. I haven't got enough information to determine what the problem is. Because it could be either, both, or a combination. I've got to add another test into this set to see if I can separate out what is happening between power and speed. So here's the plan. 10 millimeters a second, 95% power. Now this is much more cutting parameters. Lots of power and a speed to suit. Now the speed in this instance is probably a bit slow for this material that I'm cutting, but hey, we'll just produce a lot of smoke and we'll live with it. I'm not dying! 
So there we are. In that instance, it's 36 millimeters. Okay, now let's just think about all the materials that we could use on this machine. And I'm not going to list them all, but just for example, slate, glass, um, this, which is HDF, which is high density fiber board. We've got MDF, which is medium density fiber board. We've got various types of card. We've got anodized aluminium. I mean, I'm going to go away and find as many materials as I can to carry out these tests with. The one thing I'd like you to just think about here for a moment is although we've shown clearly that the focal point is changing by one millimeter because of some factor, now that factor cannot be the material because we've only got one material here. So that factor in this instance must be either speed or power that's causing the focal point to change. Now I know the focal point cannot change. It's a fixed entity within the lens. So something else is happening. But at the moment, we do not understand what that something else is. And this is part of the testing to try and narrow down and point towards what it might be. Now, the thing about a focal point is, it's the point through which all the rays supposedly pass. And therefore, it is the thinnest point in the beam. The focal point should create the same line thickness regardless of how it's moving around. Now we haven't established why it's moving around at the moment, but the, the fact that it is moving around is very clear. Remember the definition of a focal point is the point through which all the rays are passing. And therefore, that's where we should find our thinnest line. We found our thinnest line here at 36. We found our thinnest line here at 36. We found our thinnest line here at 37. The only problem is that the thinnest line there at 37 is not the same thickness as the thinnest line here at 36 or the thinnest line here at 36. It's pretty obvious, look, that these lines are substantially thicker than these lines. Using conventional focal point theory, that is totally illogical. That's something I've known for a long time, but I haven't been able to easily explain. And that's what we're in the process of trying to zoom in on over this and the next session as well. So I'm gonna go away and do all this work, and then you're gonna join me in the office where we're going to look at the results of line thickness in a few instances, and document all the results to see if we can see a pattern. Well, I'm not going to bore you with measuring any of this stuff. What we're going to look at is the way in which various beam intensities affect the material, because this is something that you won't have seen. Now, what we're looking at here is the surface of a piece of extruded acrylic. Let's look at the dots on the surface here. Yeah, they're pretty well focused. And let's go back and look at that again. What I want to do at the moment is to have a quick look at this edge just here and see whether or not I can get that into any focus, better focus, which tells me that it is above or below. So if I drop it down, it's going out of focus. So it is pretty well level with the surface of the material. I'm now going to raise the table and we're going down into the groove. And can you see in way, the way in which the granular structure on the side of the groove is gradually getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And then all of a sudden I should come into contact with the bottom of the groove. And there it is. If I needed to, I could measure the depth of that groove with this microscope. But it shows you that it's a fairly steady V-tapered groove. Now let's move on to the second groove. That all goes on the screen now, easy. So that's a narrower groove. And let's just zoom into the bottom of the groove again. And there it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, maybe thirteen turns. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Should be a wider groove than that. And yes, it is. And then we'll go for an even wider one. And we'll go right to the end 
groove, the last groove, because I want to look at that last groove where we are probably, what, three or four millimetres out of focus? Five millimetres out of focus, I think. There we go. So we're right on the surface of the material now. And you can see how granular the structure is on the edge of the groove there. Now, I'm going to move the table up by just a small amount. And wow, look how quickly. Let's move across because this groove is too wide to see in one screen. So there we go. Let's look at the middle. And we see the middle is less than one turn. It's a very shallow groove. But look at the structure of the material in there. How, uh, I don't know whether that's bubbles or they, some, some of these things definitely look like little bubbles but it's a very open, very strange, big granular structure. Let's go to the next one where we used very slow speed, but very high power, 10 millimeters a second, and the power was tremendously high. So let's look at the last groove, if we can find it. Let's just bring the edge into focus. Let's move to the middle of the picture. I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, 22. So that's very deep, but look at the structure in the bottom. It's not that granular structure. We have literally evaporated the material and left a fairly coarse grain structure behind. This looks as though it's got surface bubbles on it, which means that it has melted and then re-solidified. This was done with full power very slowly. This may be five or six millimeters out of focus. So that's 10 millimetres a second at full power, 95% power, which is more or less 70 watts. We'd look at the worst one with 10% power and 10 millimetres a second. So all we've got there is bubbles. I'm less than one turn and I'm at the bottom of the groove. Not very deep at all. So let's take a look at all these and you see they're all very, as we get a little bit more closer to the focal point we're getting a little bit deeper we've still got that same characteristic look we've got a very small heat affected zone on the outside but bubbling all the way right to the bottom here we go we're getting narrower now and what we're finding now is we've got the bottom of the groove about three or four look there's still bubbles in the bottom of that groove there but there's also some, something else very strange as well like little scallops and that's because of at 10 millimeters a second the stepper motor is going step, 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 step. And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the deeper and shallower cuts caused by the stepper motor going faster and slower. That's the narrowest one. So that's our focal line. Let's have a dig into that. So let's raise it up. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we've got those striations on the bottom caused by the stepper motor moving at so when it moves at slow speed the steps are very obvious that's what extruded acrylic looks like let's just compare that to the same results for cast acrylic so there's the first groove it's sort of slight mix of bubbles and granulation really now we go to the second one which will be slightly narrower ah now we've got that pattern in the bottom again look We've got the 10 millimetre a second stepper motor. Right, let's move to the third one and that should be a narrower one. Narrower still. So that's the optimum. If we go one beyond that, we'll see it gets thicker. Now we've got a pretty serious... Uh, now I don't know whether that's a heat affected zone or whether that's recondensed acrylic on the surface there. You know what happens when you make steam hit on a cold surface? It recondenses. Well. That could well be what you're seeing on the side there. It could well be boiling acrylic vapour that's hit on the side just at the edge there and it's recondensed in little teeny weeny blobs, little globules. The widest groove, which is this one just here. Look at the very large bubbles or crystal structure in that. And it's only one turn deep. It's amazing the different light intensities is affecting the surface, the rate at which damage is being done. Now something else that I'm sure will interest you is slate. You normally see slate as being just grey lines if you've ever engraved slate. I don't know whether you know what slate is, 
um, apart from being grey and on roofs. Basically it's a sedimentary material which was laid down on a seabed billions of years ago. It's been driven underground under high pressure and then it finishes up coming back up as mountains or something like that as a solid petrified rock. But it's still got layers in it which is why it splits into slates very easily, sedimentary layers. And the word sedimentary tells you that it must be some sort of sand or fine silt. So it's basically a silica material. When you heat it up, does this. It's actually melted. So it's crude glass. And then we move on to the next line thickness. Look at all the bubbles in there. That's why you see slate engraving as grey. You're not scratching the surface. You're not exploding bits out of the surface. You're converting the material into glass. And that's why it's dishwasher proof if you make slate engravings. These are typical engraving speeds, 400 millimeters a second and 95% power. We're now onto very high power, very low speed, 10 millimeters a second. The same power, 95%, but 10 millimeters a second. This is a surface bubble, a surface glob. It's melted and it's got all sorts of little air bubbles in it and it's yellow. All right, so that's a blob on the surface. And this is probably our thinnest line. But look at the material content, all those air bubbles in there. I mean, you would never see this with the naked eye. You'd never imagine what's going on. So you certainly wouldn't want to use high power and low speed on slate. Now, glass, of course, is made of the same sort of material, silicate, sand. And there we are. Now look at the really strange effects that glass is producing. Right. Even when I look at it in the with the naked eye, they look like little butterflies or, or seagulls taking off. It's a beautiful pattern, but I've got no idea how it comes about or why. This is 400 millimetres a second, 95% power. And now we go on to the second line, which is I think is our thinnest line. There. And look, they're the other way up this time. We can see some bubbles in the bottom there, but that groove is not very deep at all. But that's melted glass. That's not sharded. The material has now dropped below the focal point now. And look, we've got little butterflies above and below. Let's go right to the last one, shall we? I mean, that is unbelievable, isn't it? It looks as though they may well be shards, but I don't think they are. They're strange melt patterns. Because look, you can see the bubbles in the bottom. You wouldn't have bubbles if they were shards. Fascinating, isn't it? OK, let's now go on to high power, low speed. There's the surface of the glass. It's just, I, I don't know what that is. I can't believe that it is sharding because if we look at the surface you can see bubbles in there. Okay and now let's look at the low speed low power. Again we've got our lovely seagulls again look and butterflies. Very narrow line. Let's take a look at some Baltic birch very quickly. You can see the cellular structure there which is the white stuff and then the the slightly yellowy stuff or the brown stuff is the cell walls with the lignin which which takes a lot more energy to burn away. Burning wood is basically a three-stage process. You've got to burn away the light stuff, then you've got to burn away the dark stuff because it takes more energy to burn away the dark stuff. And what you're left with then is carbon. And carbon, well, you have to take that above 3000 degrees C before you make that disappear. Now there's our first line. And you can actually see very clearly there the radius on the edge of the cut. So here we are, roughly five millimetres out of focus. There's the grain structure on the surface. And look what we've got down below. We've still got the same grain structure in the bottom of the groove. All this is fascinating stuff because I've realised that understanding material structure and how light affects it is a very important part of understanding how to mark, engrave, cut materials. Every material is different. 
Right, so here we are, 38mm gallium arsenide Plano convex lens flat down. Now the working range from the focal point for this lens claims to be plus or minus 1.9mm. Ha 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 ha. We know that even a millimetre puts this thing well out of focus. Focal spot size? Mm, supposed to be 0 0.05. Now does that mean to say we're able to draw a 0 0.05 line? Theoretically, if I fire the laser beam at one spot, that means I should be able to produce a 0 0.05 spot because that's where all the energy is passing through the surface. Do I believe that likely? Absolutely no. Never got closer than probably about five or six times that specified diameter. Now the fact that I can produce a 0.05 or a 0.1 dot with my compound lens has got nothing to do with this focal spot. That's a completely different mechanism producing a dot as opposed to producing a focal spot. So here we've got all our materials that we used, anodized aluminium, ceramic tiles, glass, PET, slate, Baltic birch, etc, 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 all the way down, Biomat card, thin white card with kaolin. There's a whole range of material there. I think there's 15 materials that I chose. I've documented the speed, the power, the speed, the power, the speed, the power. So there are my three tests. I've found the thinnest line dimension in millimetres and the point at which that thinnest line occurred. Now bear in mind this is supposed to be a 38.1 lens. Very few of these happen to be 38. Let me ask these questions in blue. What is the line thickness at the focal point? Well we assumed that the thinnest line was the focal point and so I went round and measured all the lines and for these three tests, 0.05 to 0.5, 0.25 to 1.2 millimetres for maximum power, low speed, and then for low power, low speed, 0.07 to 0.4. So there's a huge range there. So our lines at the focal point were not the same size and they were not consistent. So the focal point of the lens cannot be what we're witnessing here. We're seeing some other point of focus, which is not a light ray point of focus. And then we ask the question, does the focus vary for different materials? It varies from 36 to 38, 36 to 39, 37 to 39. So whichever one of these tests we used, we were seeing change in the focal point across the material range. Then I asked the question, does the focus change with speed? We used 400 once and then we used 10 and 10 twice. So if we use the one-off as a datum, in other words these red numbers here, when we change speed do we see a change of focal point because we change the speed? Okay, I know we're changing the power as well, but let's just stay with the speed to start with. And the answer is, well, yes, 70% of the results do change. In other words, here, look, we've got 36, 36, it didn't change. But then here, 37, 38, it did change. So all the green ones are changes. Okay, and out of 30, the result was 70%. And then the next question that we asked and wanted the answer to, does the focus change with power? You know, we had power at 10% here, and then we had power at 95% and 95% on these two. So now we've swapped the whole table round, and we said, look, let's use this as our datum this time, which is the 10% power. And when we change away from 10% power, do we get a change of focal distance because of power? And the answer is 80% of the results do change. So I think in answer to our three questions, we're getting change because of power, we're getting change because of speed, and we're getting change because of material. But we still don't understand why we're getting change. What we're seeing here on this chart may well be points of focus, but it's not the focal point. We're seeing something else happening 
at a different position to the nominal manufactured focal point. And that's what we're going to have to investigate in the next session. So thanks a lot for your time today and I'll catch up with you in the next session.